why we're here. All right. <laughs> well, I think level three, the uh, or level three. I think the third edition is on about two o three or something like that. Right. And, and in the inspired edition, it's one eighty four. The authorized version. Yeah. Yeah. So. But uh, somebody just told me that somebody here has a birthday. Does anybody want to confess? Uh, <laughs> John sounds like he's in pain. I'm guessing it's John. Oh, my back! Oh, my back! <laughs> Let me ask this. Does anybody else have a birthday? You never know, right? You never know. All right. Well, who can lead us in a little chorus of round and round about? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear John. Happy birthday to you. Well, he deserves to get sung to. That's dedication. He came here tonight on his birthday. <laughs> I'd be, I'd be tempted to still be home eating cake. But, uh, here tonight, that's a good thing. Yeah. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you uh, for your many blessings to us, Lord, tonight. Uh, I pray for John, thanking you for another year for him. And just pray your blessing on him in the coming year. And pray, Father, that you would just bless our study here tonight. As we uh, go through and, and look at the levels of meaning, Father, help us to understand how important this lesson really is. And help us to understand it. Uh, in such a way that uh, we might be able to convey that to others, Lord, for we know that uh, truly the truth, your word, is under fire today. And we pray that you would bless our time then. Because of it, help us to be aware in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Levels of meaning. Uh, chapter 11 in either of the editions starts off with an illustration that's uh, a pretty cool illustration. It kind of sets us up uh, for our lesson here tonight. Do I need a microphone, Chris? <laughs> are, we, are we taping it on there? Yeah, we're taping it. Okay. Do you have a microphone over there? Do I have a microphone? I see it. Sounds fairly loud. It is fairly loud. This <laughs> one, I'll get you. How bad that is? I'll figure it out. Yeah, there's a there's a vein there that you can just kind of turn. Sure. All right. Does that sound better? Yeah. Sounds pretty good. good. All right. Great. Thanks, John. Yep. All right. So. He starts off with an illustration. I just want to get your, um, you know, kind of wrap your head around where we're going to go with this lesson tonight. And he starts with this uh, second paragraph there. But beginning uh, in the first paragraph, he asks the question, and we'll answer this at the very end, but you already know, I'm sure, what the answer is. Does the Bible have different levels of meaning? That is, after we see the so-called surface meaning or literal meaning, are there any other deeper levels of spiritual meaning? And this chapter looks at that question. So imagine yourself, you go to a Bible study, and there's a dozen other college students. This is great, because this is a college textbook. So you know, put yourself in college now, right? But you don't have to linger there, because you can put yourself into any Bible study in any church, and you'll find uh, similarities. Uh, exam examining uh, this story is fascinating to me. Um, he sets the stage with a dozen other college students. Uh, it's your first time in this study and you're a bit uncomfortable. You've devoured several chocolate chip cookies and now you're concentrating on your Mountain Dew. There you go, college, right? There you go. Tall skinny guy sitting next to your right uh, opens with prayer and you're pretty sure his name's Josh, but you've only met him once. After prayer, he reads the passage to be discussed. It's Luke 15, 8 through 10, which says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. 
Now, this group of college students are going to go through and they're going to seek to determine the meaning of this passage. What would you do if you were at that Bible study, especially if you were the leader of that Bible study, how would you go about seeking to determine the meaning of that passage in Luke? What would you do? Read more. Read more. Okay. Exactly, exactly what do you mean by that, Bill? I would start about five paragraphs before that in the Bible and do about five paragraphs after to see where it lays in the Bible and what the overall structure is. Okay, and let me just, if, if I'm wrong, you can correct me, but what you're doing is, the first thing he's doing is determining what? The context. He's trying to find out what is the preceding context and what is the following context. How does this fit into the whole versus just pulling those couple, three verses out and looking at that? How many agree with Bill's approach? All right. What else would you do? What else would you do? See how it relates to other parts of the Bible. All right. You're going to consult the biblical map, and if we're going to go on the interpretive journey, what would be the first thing we would do after we determine the context? See the meaning in this. Okay, what does this meaning possibly mean in Jesus' day? How would they, Jesus' audience, upon hearing this, how would they process this? What would they think about it? Okay, so great point. Uh, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to determine uh, if there's a leap from their time and what they see and what we see. And this is actually a pretty simple one because it's someone who loses something, right? I mean, I preached on this not too long ago. Do you remember the illustration I used? I had one of those little tiles on my keychain. And I said, we always you know, tend to lose things. And number one item people lose are their car keys. And so I had that tile and I'd given it to somebody in church. And uh, I didn't know, in the second service at least, I didn't know uh, who had it. And then I pressed the, the, the button on my phone, and my phone triggered the tile, and it beeped, and I knew where it was. Well, the point was, and the point is, that that passage is actually about what? Finding something. Finding something. Exactly. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to study the Bible. And then you'll appreciate that, especially as we go through this, uh, this chapter. But here's our college class. Okay, continues Josh. There are more cookies in the kitchen. That's good to know. So what do you think this passage means? What is God trying to teach us here? What do you think of that approach? What's that look like? What does this passage mean, Josh? Pass. Now remember, this is how Josh starts out the study, right? He jumped to the end of the process. Yeah. Okay, okay. He, uh, when you go through that interpretive journey, you have to be able to identify theological principles. That's why, to the contextual point that Bill made, you will never arrive at the theological principles that you need to arrive at if you only take this one little teaching and don't look at for an act. You've got to consider the verses around it, and when you do that, it makes total sense, all right? And so by throwing this out there and asking them what this means, how would they know what it means, right? So let's go on. So this girl points out she's uh, blonde, wearing a Point of Grace t-shirt, okay? And she says, my Bible study, my study Bible says that houses in those days had low roofs and few windows. So it's kind of hard to see in there. That's why she needed the lamp. Yeah, okay, that's profound. Um, Jared, a guy you know from your English class, he's sitting across eating Fritos. He sits up, chimes in. Yeah, and she has to sweep out the house because it's dirty. We have a dark, dirty house with not much light. I think this is like the world. You know what I mean? When we drift back into the world, it's like being that coin, not able to see clearly. Lost in the dark and in the dirt, unable to see Jesus. So the house stands for the world. We're the coin when we backslide. So Jesus, of course, is the one who comes and looks for us, finds us in the dark. Now you're thinking that, Jared, he makes pretty good sense. He's a smart guy. Then you remember your English class and think, yeah, yeah. He, he, I, and then you're shaking your head like, yeah, yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> so you're saying that the woman is Jesus, objects a big guy named Matt. I can't go for that. 
What did you just read uh, not too long ago that the the uh, the woman was Jesus? What, what, the shack, right? The shack, yeah. Shack, great book on spiritualizing things, right? Makes no sense at all. Matt, Matt is a macho kind of guy. He lived down the hall from you in the dorm. He drives a nice pickup, but he's not really a rocket science, so you maybe you're thinking he's kidding, but he looks serious. It's a parable, answers Jared. It doesn't matter if they portray Jesus as a woman. Well, I don't have any problem with Jesus being played by a woman, offers Jessica. She's really cute, you know, by, by the way. And he goes on. And, and, and you know, here's this kid. And he's in this Bible study, and he's processing this with other college students. He's noticing all the girls. Um, and as he's doing that, uh, but Jared, Jessica continues, I never thought of the house as referring to the world. When I think of a dark place where people can get lost, I think of the church today. I mean, look at all the churches today that aren't really following Jesus, just preaching psychology and stuff. You know, it's, it's like that church in Revelation that Jesus uh, says is lukewarm, the one he'll spit out of his mouth. The church really needs the light of the gospel. And remember that all those early churches were house churches, weren't they? I mean, they met in houses instead of churches like we do, so the house could be referring to the church. Makes sense to me anyway, she says. It's making sense to you too, especially since she looked right at you and smiled when she got done. <laughs> right? So you nod your head in agreement. Hey, moron, can see she's right. So, but then what would the coin be, asked Brian, a sleepy-looking skater wearing long, ragged, tan-colored shorts, blown out Nikes and a black faded Dave Matthews t-shirt. Is there any more diff for those Fritos? Well, responds Jessica, maybe the coin represents the true, faithful congregations that just seem to get lost in the middle of all those other churches who don't know what's going on. That that's, that's the way it looks to me. Thanks, Brian says. He gets up and lumbers into the kitchen, and maybe the, the woman in the story really represents the pastor of a true, store, a true church, suggests Jared. He's sweeping all, out all of the false doctrine, trying to find true believers. Okay, so then the point of Grace Girl, she comes back and says, if the house is dark and dirty, probably referring to our hearts, isn't that what dark and dirty is in our lives? And so we try and try to follow Jesus, but we fail because our hearts aren't clean. However, Jesus comes, cleans our hearts, just like the woman in the story. He sweeps them out, forgives us of our sins. I like to think of Jesus as sweeping out my heart and making me clean. Isn't that neat? She smiles brightly, looks down at her Bible as she continues. And look at this. This is really awesome. My study Bible says that the brooms they had in Jesus in the Bible days were made of numerous two-foot-long straws bundled together and tied at the top. Wow. You know, like one straw can't do anything, but when they're bundled together, then they're really strong. The broom is kind of like the Bible. I mean, Jesus sweeps out our heart, right? What does he use to cleanse us? The Bible. So the Bible is composed of lots of individual books, 66 to be exact. They're all bound together as, so they'll be strong. So Jesus cleanses our hearts with the Bible. Isn't that awesome? Now you're thinking the point of Grace Girl is pretty insightful into this stuff, and you wish uh, you could see something so deep and spiritual. All right? So this is the idea behind the, the spiritualizing. You're looking for a deeper meaning. A deeper meaning. You're going to try to, you're going to try to come up with something that's really, really profound. You're going to try to to make that happen. So the next section, the next heading in your book is spiritualizing. And he asks the question: Do you know how arbitrary the various interpretations were in the story? None of them seemed overly concerned to determine the meaning Jesus intended when he spoke the words or what Luke intended when he wrote down the episode under the guidance of the Spirit. None of these Bible study participants seem to notice the context. For instance, and he goes through this, and this is really, this is really a great illustration. The preceding story deals with the parable of the shepherd who loses one of his sheep, leaves the 99, and searches till he finds the lost one, at which time he rejoices. The following story is the parable of the lost son in which the father rejoices when his lost son returns. And he says, uh, the three parables go together. They all speak of the joy God feels when someone who was lost comes to faith and is saved. So Jesus is not using the house to represent anything specific in our lives. He's just making a comparison. The woman's concerned over losing the coin because the coin's important to her. God feels the same way toward us. You see, he's looking at us and we're important to him. She goes to great lengths to find the coin, and God is going to great lengths to redeem us. And this is the example of Jesus. This is why God sent his only begotten son, because God cares. And Israel is the lost nation of Israel. 
and the Gentiles are worse. <laughs> so there's a lot of finding that needs to be done. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, so, so the one point that we have to make here is we have to be very careful not to miss the obvious meaning of the text because we're trying to find some hidden, deep, spiritual meaning. And we're trying to come up with something that is, is really, really profound. When we attempt to find that hidden, super spiritual meaning, we usually find ourselves moving into an area of reader response. What is reader response? I put that up here. Reader's response means what? <laughs> Okay, the reader has the authority to determine the meaning, right? That's reader response. And we contrast reader response with what? Authorial intent. And that is the author controls the meaning because he's the one who wrote it. And we gave the illustration of the Wizard of Oz, and we said, it's okay when you deal with the Wizard of Oz, or you deal with a, a pop song, you can kind of massage it and make it into what you want it to be. But you cannot do that with the Word of God. The Word of God is different, and you dare not do that uh, because God's Word is perfect and it's holy, and he's given to us the desired meaning that he has for us to be able to understand. Now, occasionally in discussions on biblical interpretation, there's a dichotomy presented between a literal meaning and a spiritual meaning. And... Uh, the author of our, our book here is uncomfortable with saying, well, our method of interpretation is literal. Now, I'll give, you, I'll give you what I was taught in seminary. It was three-pronged. It was like the, the three-legged stool. As long as you had the three legs, the stool could stand. But you first of all had a hermeneutic of it's literal. You're going to take it literal in every situation that you can take it literal. When you can't take it literal, Jesus says, behold, I am the door. Okay, well, he, we knew he wasn't really a door, but we would take other things literally. We're also going to look at what does this mean in their town? That's the historical part. And then grammatically, we're looking at the language in order to be able to determine what is the level of meaning. What, what is this meaning that God is trying to uh, extend to us? Now, for us today, we don't want to have a literal and a spiritual meaning. And he goes on, and I think he's right on by massaging this just a little bit and saying, when it comes to literal versus literary meaning, literary meaning is better because literary meaning overrides everything. In other words, we understand that there's going to be symbolism in Scripture. We understand that. Uh, we're not ignoring that reality. Uh, you, by the time you get to, to Daniel and Revelation, Ezekiel, there's a lot of symbolism that's going on. But there's still within symbolism a literary meaning that we're trying to find. Does that make sense? So, so we're saying here, uh, literal versus spiritual, we're saying, okay, if it can't be taken literal, then it has to be taken in spiritual. You know, we've got to figure that part out. That lends itself, if you do literal versus spiritual, it lends itself more to spiritualizing the text. We're after the literary meaning 24-7. We are after that. That's what we want to know. I don't care if we're in Proverbs. I don't care if we're in the Psalms. I don't care if we're in Revelation. We're looking for literary meaning. I want to make sure that that's really clear to, to all of us. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. So we're, we're understanding uh, basically what he's saying. For this reason, he goes on and he says, we prefer the term literary meaning. It refers to the meaning the authors have placed in the text. So it reflects the type of literature used, the context, historical background, grammar, word meanings, everything that we've been studying. In other words, the dichotomy, and this is how we need to understand it, it's not between literal meaning and spiritual meaning. Uh, that's not where we want to draw the line. The dichotomy is between authorial intent and reader response. You with me? That's where our dichotomy is. On the one side, it's either reader response. Hey, I think this uh, you know, coin refers to Jesus. Well, I think that, you know, I think the house is, okay, that's reader response. Versus what is the author's intent? And that passage in Luke is marvelous 
Um, I don't think it's that difficult to see it if we just open our eyes and do that first step that Bill mentioned, and that is look at the context. And then you realize, hey, this is one of three things where you have someone lost or something lost, and there's this huge effort to go find it. And that's a reflection on God sending Jesus to come and find lost sinners like me. It's a great lesson. I think that's all the spiritual I need. I don't need to get off into the weeds of what somebody thinks about the house or something else. Because by spiritualizing that, what they're guilty of is missing the author's intention. And that's a serious, that's a serious issue if you miss the author's intention. So spiritualizing isn't based on the text. It's a product of our imaginations. Isn't that great? Allegory. When you think of allegory, there were many early scholars that felt the Old Testament would only be relevant if it spoke directly of Jesus. And they developed a whole system of interpretation that acknowledged a literal meaning of the text, but then it encouraged the interpreter to look for the deeper, fuller, spiritual meaning below the surface of the text. There was a two-level system, literal and spiritual, while others expanded into a multi-level system where you had body, soul, and spirit, or four system, literal, allegorical, moral, anecdotal. So, for example, that fourfold system would see four levels of meaning. So, allegorical interpretation has, has gone away from authorial intent. And he makes the point here of saying that the reformers uh, were, in the Reformation, were largely responsible uh, for changing from this allegorical interpretation. There's not a lot of difference between spiritualizing the text and allegorical interpretation. Right? There's not a lot of difference, just so that you're very much aware of that. The Reformation uh, kind of called people back to looking at the scripture. Now, I mean, you have to stop and think about this, but the Roman Catholic Church, what is their method of interpretation? Okay, the, 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 priest, the priest determines it, but, but how, does their, how does their interpretation roll? Are they literal, historical, grammatical when they look at the scriptures? Not at all. Not at all. That's why they come up with a lot of different things. Can you, can you think of something that, that the Catholic Church believes that's not in the Bible? Purgatory. That'd be one. I think they gave that up. <laughs> <laughs> and recently they changed their view. No. I don't think so. That would be a financial disaster. <laughs> That's where you get all that money. Turning into the Now, when you have that type of allegorical interpretation, you go to it and say, well, okay, where is purgatory in the Bible? Um, that would be a huge problem. So somebody like Martin Luther is going to look at the scripture and say, well, wait a minute. And so he had much more of a literary meaning type of philosophy, although it wasn't anything like what we are today and what we're trying to do. The Catholic Church was just so allegorical that, that you couldn't challenge them on anything because if the Pope said, this is what I think this means, from wherever, if that's the law. The reformers were better, but there were gaps, and there's still gaps. If, if you uh, are reformed in your theology, for instance, and uh, I, I know some people that are reformed in their theology that, that are regular attenders here, one of the things that's a real bugaboo is for someone who's reformed, by the time they get to the book of Revelation or any of the eschatology, Okay, it's a huge, huge problem. Uh, because if you do a literary meaning emphasis here with your hermeneutic, there it poses so many problems to covenant theology. And, and if I'm talking over your head, I, I apologize, but try to pick up what you can. Um, we're dispensational in our theology. The other side of that is covenant in their theology. And I understand dispensational theology ranges, there's progressive and so forth, and this is not a dispensations class, so don't get excited. But with Reformed theology, uh, the problem comes when you come to eschatology, end times, all right? 
What do we do with this? This doesn't fit our covenants and our covenant theology. And so you can go and uh, there's a lot of real liberal pro uh, Presbyterian churches, I'll pick up Presbyterian. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of them that are very, very liberal, don't follow the word of God. They're mainline denominational churches. And you'll know if you ever go to one because you'll sit there and go, what? Um, and then there's some other ones that uh, are much more uh, solid in their, in their delivery of, of the word of God and they're true to the text. However, even those, uh, they follow a hermeneutic such as literary meaning all the way through scripture until they get to eschatology. And then it just doesn't fit. And then they have to go allegorical. So that's kind of interesting to me. I sit there and go, oh, okay. Because um, I don't think it's that difficult. I think, I think that, that you follow the literary meaning approach and you go on through, and it's consistent from Genesis right on through Revelation. And, and you see the consistency. And it's, and it's I don't know, I, I, take, I take comfort in that. I, I look at that and I say, wow, great. You know, I, I see how it all fits together, and it's all you know, uh, a wonderful thing. When you get off into allegory, though, you're going to find that you can go a lot of different directions. And that's kind of what happens. When you think of allegorical approaches, there are books that are written that are allegorical. Pilgrim's Progress, great example, if you've ever read that. Total allegory, you know, but it's fine. You know, it's not, it doesn't say it's the word of God, okay? So it's just a, a really cool illustrative story. And uh, it, it makes its point, it's, it's phenomenal, right? And then you have in your text there the um, illustration of Isaiah chapter five, verses 1 through 7. And, and that's truly an allegory within the scripture. All right, So the scriptures will use allegory as a literal, literary device. Does that make sense? All right, so, so we're not saying that we're allegorical when we get to Isaiah 5, but we're saying Isaiah is allegorical, but here's the difference. It doesn't leave us out there on the edge of the, out the, edge of the branch. Verse 7 says, here's the interpretation. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah, and the garden of his delight. So he tells us basically what these things are. So you have this allegory that goes down from 1 to 6, verses 1 through 6. And then in verse 7, you have it basically explained. So Isaiah's preaching this passage to Israel to warn them that God's going to judge them for their lack of justice and righteousness. He uses an extended metaphor, and fortunately, he identifies the meaning of the allegory in verse 7. So, so that's a good thing. So allegory in itself is not a bad thing. It's just another, as I mentioned, literary device. However, allegorical interpretation as an interpretive method is very different from allegory, a standalone allegory like Isaiah chapter 5 um, in this example, because an allegory... Um, allegorical method of interpretation uh, can really mislead us. So we have to be very careful. Just remember that there are very few texts in the Bible where you have um, an allegory, okay? So, so be, be careful you don't attach it as you're studying it to many different things, all right? Does that make sense? Questions? So, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, so if I understand they're very um, opposing, right? You're saying, <clears throat> you're saying literal versus allegory. While there might be allegory in in the text as a literature, but right. but we're not discounting the the historical and, lit and the literal meaning, right? And saying it's out all allegory. Yeah, and that's what he, that's what you have verse seven there. So verse seven explains to us that this is this, this is this. So then you go, oh, okay, that's what I, I just got through reading this, verses one through six, and I'm, I'm reading it, and it's an allegory, you've got this extended metaphor, and I'm trying to figure out what these you know, pieces are, and then he tells us what the pieces are. So you have an allegory within Isaiah, but an allegory is different than an allegorical method of interpretation, because an allegorical method of interpretation basically boils down to reader's response, and that's what you have to be careful about. Okay? All right, are, are you ready for a lesson here? All right, so take a piece of paper, and you're going to look up 1 Kings 17, 1 through 6. 
And it's at the back of the chapter. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, it's at the back of the chapter. Elijah the Tishbite, from Tishbite to Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. And then he goes on and he tells the story. What I want you to do is, I want you to do an allegorical interpretation of this passage. I want you to write it down in your own words, okay? And so you're going to basically do an allegorical interpretation. You're going to tell me what this means. I don't want you to look at the context. I don't want you to do any of the good things you've learned. I just want you to go off the hook with this and make up the most ridiculous allegorical interpretation that you can muster. <laughs> so, what you're going to do is, as you look at this, you're going to say, okay, well, Elijah. Is, is Elijah truly Elijah the Tishbite, or maybe Elijah stands for something? Um, there'll be neither dew nor rain. That's probably not literal dew or rain. It's probably something else, right? And... Um, Few years could actually, you know, I think in Daniel, one one year is one week is worth a year, so maybe, hmm. Okay, use your imagination.
put this assignment out there when I was teaching in China. The class was uh, mumbling to themselves and talking among themselves. And I looked at the interpreter, and he gave me a funny look. And he said, uh, they're having a problem with this assignment because you've been teaching them all week yep. that this is the wrong way to do it. And now you're telling them, to go ahead and do this. And uh, so I, I pleaded with them to follow through uh, just to make the point. And uh, I asked if anybody wanted to read uh, you know, a paragraph of this uh, interpretational uh, style. And uh, there were two guys who stood up and, and read. And I'm telling you what, it, it was hilarious. I mean, just hilarious. They totally understood it. They got it 100%. And, uh, you know, it was, it was funny. I mean, these were ravens, but they started out as white doves, and they became sinful as they flew through a dark cloud. And the next thing you know, they came out as ravens, and they were, you know, but I mean, he had it all kind of worked out. It was just, uh, it was just pretty, pretty funny. And you can go in a million directions when you do allegorize, and that's the that's the point of this of this assignment is that you, you're not even close to the literary meaning that the author intended. You're not even close, and you're not trying to even make an attempt. You're just trying to um, put something together that will capture the interest of your audience. And it, it, great if it makes you look spiritual. All right, uh, remember the college kids. Um, if, if you're viewed as someone who has a pretty good grasp and uh, pretty pretty in-depth uh, view of these things, then that's uh, pretty pretty neat. Uh, but uh, it's far from the point. Now, does anybody have one of theirs that they'd like to read and maybe, or just give us, you know, their main points as to uh, uh, how this might roll out allegorically? Anyone brave? There's no right or wrong, so. <laughs> it's um, really saying to start a new church. Um, no do or vain, no message to refresh your soul. So it's not going to be in. So you have to go to the Brook Cherub, which is something new he's going to send. So you have to leave and go far away to get this new message, which flows into the Jordan River, which is, it will become, it's prophecy also, a big, new, life giving cult. <laughs> so drink there, and I don't know what to do with the ravens. <laughs> Those pesky ravens are really angels. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're, the Bible says we'll entertain angels unaware, and so that's what they are. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. Like no, no, no. The ravens are the Holy Spirit. Holy right. Spirit. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. How did I miss that? You really did. Right. So the Holy Spirit. Okay. <laughs> Being fed the ravens in morning and evening. I mean. I can't believe you missed that. It's so clear to me. Yeah. No, I took it literal. The Ravens are the football team. <laughs> 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 that's what I said. I had that too. That's what I said. You must be onto something there. The Ravens are the Ravens are the football team. They're coming to see them twice a day. Oh, my God. What's prophetic? They're going to win the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah, we know that's not right. So, how do we all feel? Because we keep the evangelists. And that's what they said to me in China. They said, um, they said that this is the, the common way that preachers preach over in China. Um, and, and so even though there's people getting saved in like, you know, droves, uh, it's wonderful. But the reality is they're, they're really hungry for solid teaching. And that's why this, this grasping God's word is essential to the church in China. And that's why it is... Uh, you know, one-on-one stuff. So uh, China Vision is, is teaching this um, in two segments. So we've gone through the first segment after next week, and then the back half of this book basically takes what we've learned on the interpretive journey and it applies it directly to the specific genres of scripture. And so it's going to apply to the Gospels. It's going to apply to Acts. It's going to apply to wisdom. How do we apply this to wisdom literature? How do we apply this to minor prophets? How do we apply this to Revelation? How do we apply it to Pauline epistles? And so that's the second half of this book. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really good stuff there as, as well. And very, very helpful. In fact, if you're a teacher and you plan to use what you've learned 
And for instance, you're uh, saying next, uh, next week or week after you're going to be teaching from the Gospels, by all means, go to that chapter that deals with how to put the interpretive journey into the context of the Gospels. Utilize this book. It's a great tool. Great tool. Um, even, it gives you so many really, really terrific uh, pointers. It's got a whole section on Proverbs. You know, that's worth studying just so. I mean, it really is worth studying because Proverbs can become very, very confusing. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but you can read things in Proverbs that, that you sit there and say, well, okay, so is that always true, right? I mean, you know, uh, the person who works hard is going to get rich. Does that happen all the time? Anybody here work hard? Anybody who works hard? Not rich. Okay. So, so you're looking at it and going, yeah, I work really hard. I just, you know, I'm, you know it's, it's, I'm not getting ahead. I'm spending my... But he's got a, a principle. And the principle is a... It, it's an eternal principle in the sense that if you don't work, you will... That was the flip side in Proverbs, right? You will end up in poverty. All right, the the you know the ant consider the ant thou slugger, you know how he works and so forth. I mean, there's just so many truths there, but it's not universal. Like God's not saying this is a hundred percent guarantee. It's a it's an eternal principle that normally is going to manifest itself if you follow it. Okay, but maybe or maybe not to the degree that it's mentioned there. So you got to keep that in mind. And so he gives great illustrations in there to prove his point. I'm just hitting the a couple little peaks there, but um, you get the idea. Now, let's um, do this with a deep side. We are going to um, look at an illustration of this. And he picks on uh, none other than Martin DeHaan. You know Marty DeHaan? How many of you have heard of Marty DeHaan? Okay. A whole bunch of you have. Uh, Well-known, popular radio preacher. It's not every morning on 1 o'clock. There you go. 5.30 in the morning. There you go. So uh, he gives an interpretation of Genesis chapter 2, verses 18, 25. And you may remember, um, you know, after the Lord God made a woman from the rib, he had taken out a man. He brought her to man, and man said, this is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman. She was taken out of man. Dahan allegorizes this passage with the following interpretation. While Adam slept, God created from his wounded side a wife who was part of himself, and he paid for her by the shedding of his blood. Now all is clear. Adam's a picture of the Lord Jesus, who left his father's house to gain his bride at the price of his own life. Jesus, the last Adam, like the first, must be put to sleep to purchase his bride, the church. And Jesus died on the cross and slept in the tomb for three days and three nights. His side, too, was open after he had fallen asleep, and from that wounded side, redemption flowed. It's almost as good as the Ravens. Like the football team. <laughs> okay, so, so here's a very well-known uh, radio preacher who's, I wouldn't say he's heretical. He, I think if he would look at our doctoral statement here. He would agree. We would look at his. We would agree. Uh, that, that's, that's not the problem. The problem is how are you going to arrive at the literary meaning? Do you think that that was the literary meaning? That's truly not the literary meaning. That is an allegory, and he makes some interesting connections there, doesn't he? I, and, and you'll see there's a section here, if you flip back a few pages, uh, typology. And I don't, I don't think I'm even going to go there, even though it's a big section. Basically, there were a pretty good number of years ago an attempt to see Jesus in every Old Testament passage. And so he's a type of Christ. He's a type of Christ. He's a type of Christ. Okay. Are there types of Christ? Yes. Okay. But you have to be very careful. And you, you've got to be careful not to go about seeking the literary meaning based upon your overwhelming desire to find a type of Christ there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because that's what Marty Hahn's doing here with this passage of scripture. And it uh, causes a lot of confusion and does not bring you to the point that you want to be 
because you're really trying to discover the literary meaning. So Dehan, he's pretty imaginative, and as your book is going to say, uh, his meaning has been read back into the text rather than developed from the text. I would, if you take notes, you want to write this down, what he's done is eisegesis versus exegesis. Eisegesis, I'm reading back into the text. Exegesis is what a good Bible student does. He tries to extract the literal meaning, the literary meaning from that passage. So we're all exegetes. You didn't know you were an exegete, did you? So really? What's that mean? Well, you're exegetical. You're trying to pull that literary meaning out of the text. You don't want to be reading into the text something that's not there. Like Karen, she just found that there's a new church going to start, a uh, whole movement of churches that's going to start. It's all flowing on down the Jordan River. And, uh, you know, it's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. <laughs> it has nothing, yeah, I'm only, that was an illustration. <laughs> she doesn't really believe that. All right, there you go. Okay. Yeah, Karen Smith. Um, so by trying to find, here's the, the key there. So by trying to find a deep spiritual meaning in Genesis 2, he ignores the context of the chapter. This is an important teaching, he says, here in our notes about marriage, actually. So God's message to us on marriage is a spiritual message. We don't need to search imaginations for some strained connection to the death of Christ in order to make this passage relevant. Everything he says about the significance, significance of Christ and his death is true. Christ did die for his bride, the church, and redemption does flow from his side. However, simply because one understands the significance of Christ's death does not mean that he or she understands Genesis 2. All right? So that's a, that's a big, big mistake, and it's easily made. Um, but now that you've studied it, you're not going to make it, right? Um, Another area where you have a lot of tendency to spiritualize is in a study on the tabernacle, all right? And you will, you will see this. We know that the significance of the tabernacle is the physical location of the presence of God. So it's important, and the presence of God is still critically important. We um, see examples of, of some of this, and he has an example here. Uh, you might need to flip the page. Uh, but allegorical interpreters seem to search for any loose semantic or thematic connection between the details of the tabernacle and Jesus' life. Mm -hmm. right? This is what you typically see. So I'm going to try to connect the tabernacle with Jesus in any way I possibly can. Here's the example. And it's a crazy example. Exodus 27:19 is a reference to tent pegs. King James calls them pins. It's a popular allegorical approach that would lead you to search for some type of connection between Christ and the ten pegs. Think for a minute and see what you can dream up. We don't have time for that. Of course, if the pegs were made of wood, we could say that they represent the cross, but they're made of bronze. Brass. So maybe we can come up with something for bronze. Bronze, think about it. It doesn't decay. It doesn't rot like wood. And the salvation we find in Jesus doesn't decay or rot either. So maybe the bronze pegs represent our enduring relationship with Christ. Isn't that great, allegory? How about that? Moreover, the ten pegs also hold up the size of the curtain walls. This holding up idea should give us some fertile field to work with. Jesus holds us up and supports us. He's our firm anchor. And you get the idea of where all this goes. Or perhaps we could even think about the sharp point at the end of the, the peg. The way Christ is narrow. It's a narrow point. Point of the ten pegs. Show that. Or what about the ground the pegs are driven into? Christians can't grow unless Christ comes into our lives. Perhaps the ground is our heart. And the tent peg placed firmly into the ground represents Christ coming into our lives. Oh, man. All this good, deep, theological, spiritualizing, allegorical hooey. <laughs> allegorical interpreters are able to find Christological, Christological meaning in all the details, even the tent pegs. So there's an example of this Lewis Talbot. And he wrote, the pins or nails, ten pegs, of the tabernacle were made of brass, therefore they did not rust. They withstood every desert storm, even so Christ's holy life withstood every onslaught of Satan. How minutely the details of the God-given pattern for the tabernacle in the wilderness foreshadow the glories of our crucified and risen Lord. 
What do you think about that? A stretch? A stretch? I can't even begin to tell you how common allegorical interpretations are everywhere. You've got a daily devotional. On the side, there's a little quip. And you read it, and it's going to tend to be more like that than anything else. Uh, you've got a book, and it's got you know a whole bunch of different sayings, <coughs> and they're nice sayings, they're good sayings, but they're allegorical. And so they tend to be all over the landscape, all over the landscape. We are getting pummeled by allegorical nonsense that in and of itself, you look at it and you go, oh, that's a really nice thought. I think I'll, you know, I must have got that in my uh, daily devotional, you know, the free ones they give away at church. And isn't that a really nice thing? Um, I won't go to name it. But, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you can pick up all this stuff, and it's everywhere. And I hope that this class and our, our time together will kind of train our brain to say, whoa, 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 you know, that's a nice thought, but man, where did you get that? That's certainly not the literary meaning. That's not the literary intention of the author. That is not at all. It's an allegorical interpretation. And the problem with allegorical interpretations are, and he gives the example of, of Dahan uh, here again with these ten pegs, is that in certain situations they, they can appear fairly harmless. But understand, we base our faith on the word of God. Right? All scriptures given by inspiration of God. Right? It's profitable for correction of doctrine. So the man of God may be what? Mature, complete. And if we don't understand that literary meaning, how is the word of God going to impact us? You see, it's not pure. I, I think that's the best way I can describe it. It's not pure. By reading Talbot's statement, um, oh, it's nice, and oh, whoa, he, he really is smart, but it's not pure. And so it's not going to have its impact. Uh, you can go to a church that the word of God is, is not really preached straight up in the sense that they're striving there to give a literary meaning, they give maybe more allegory, or it's a topical thing, and it pulls from every spectrum. But the problem is, my spiritual maturity and my spiritual growth depends upon the Word of God. Would you agree with that statement? And if it does, it needs to be pure. It needs to be pure. I hope the water that I'm drinking right now is pure. Does that make sense? We want that to be pure. There are certain things we won't take a substitute for. And the Word of God should be that same, same way. And there are many who, who, seeking an audience, I would say, will tend to go and dip their toes into the allegorical swamp and come up with certain things that sound interesting to the people and are misleading. Now, these ten guys, these, these are fascinating <coughs> ten guys because Dahan actually outdoes Talbot because he's going to draw deep significance from the fact that the pegs were actually half buried in the ground. So Martin DeHaan looks at 10 pegs and he thinks, okay, 10 pegs, they're, they're, half, they're half in, they're half out, right? I mean, you walked around some of these big white tents, don't those pegs stick out of the ground? Sure, now you're on the same page as Martin DeHaan. Yeah, you realize it, you're thinking to yourself, yeah, yeah, and you're thinking to yourself, fine, okay. So he goes on and he says this, we repeat, the pens were buried in the ground, but also emerged from the ground. And it speaks of the death and resurrection, that which is buried and that which is above the ground. The part of the pins beneath the ground becomes a symbol of the death of Jesus Christ. The part above suggests the resurrection. This is the gospel, the good news of salvation, the finished work that makes us secure. If the pins were driven all the way into the ground, they would be worthless. Part of them must be above the ground in order that the ropes might be attached to them. So, too, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ by itself could not save a single sinner. The good news of the gospel is not only the cross, but also the death of Christ for sinners. It's the death plus the resurrection. The pins are buried, but they're also, uh, they also rise above the ground in order to make us secure. Okay, where do you get that? I mean, a lot of what he said was true, right? We, we would agree with that. But where does he get that? Where does he even get the understanding that they're half even in the ground and half out of the ground? 
He's created an entire level of spiritual meaning from a questionable connection between the unmentioned partial burial of tent pegs and the resurrection. So there's dozens of connotations that tent pegs have. Are we free to draw theology from all of these connotations? For example, there were numerous tent pegs used in the tabernacle, probably hundreds. Do these numerous tent pegs really represent a good symbol for Christ? This can lead to the heretical view that there are many Christ. Also observe that people drove the pegs into the ground and people pulled them up again. Is this a good symbol of resurrection? Both writers above assume that the pegs were always expertly driven into the ground so they never slipped. Is that true? God did not drive the tent pegs in. People did. Have you ever been camping and in trouble with your tent pegs? No doubt, in spite of what Talbot said above, these tent pegs of the tabernacle probably slip once in a while or pull loose in strong wind. Does this, Je does this mean Jesus can't be trusted? How absurd. And how does Dahan know that the pegs were buried half in and half out? Those of you who have pitched tents in soft sand also know normal tent pegs are useless in soft sand unless the entire peg is buried. They're called a dead man. So did the priests in Exodus ever do this? Numbers 3 and 4. The Merorite clan, the Levite tribe, was given responsibility for retaining and carrying the tent pegs. What does this do to Dahan's Christiology? Does the Old Testament priesthood care for Christ and carry him on their backs? as these priests carry the tent pegs? Do you see how absurd that is? And it, it really kind of goes in a lot of directions. And I said to you that we have to be careful because we want the word of God to be pure. And we want a, a true literary meaning. But it also, and this is the danger, another danger of the allegorical, is the allegorical can produce heretical teaching. Because again, it, it becomes, it's a, it's a a level of reader response. This is what I think this passage means to me. I'm determining the meaning, not the author. And that's very, very dangerous. You have a cult leader who looks at the word and develops his own meaning. You have uh, Muslim extremists who are doing the same thing with the Quran, where they're looking at the Quran and they are developing a reader's response, right? And they're deciding, well, okay, well, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're not going to do. And they kind of pick and choose. It's very dangerous, and it leads you into all types of, of error, potentially. And you and I need to be very careful about that. Now, at the bottom of my page, it says, was there symbolism in the tabernacle? Absolutely. But symbolism should be sought against the ancient Near Eastern background in which the people were living, and they were familiar with it. He goes on and he talks about... Um, some of the allegorical interpretations with regard to the colors of the material used on the tabernacle. And, and it just kind of gets crazy, even with the blue meaning all of this different thing. Now, blue probably did mean something. I think all those colors do mean something. But you have to be very careful. And he gives the illustration uh, of really understanding in their mind. Again, you're going to go back, what does this mean in their mind? the original people who were there, uh, they looked at it and they saw something very, very different than what people who are doing uh, allegorizing see. And so because of that, again, if, if you're looking not at what they believe, but you're going to allegorize this and do the reader's response, you're never really going to come up with the literary meaning. So that's an important point uh, to just stick in the back of your mind. All right? Questions? Does anybody have um, are, are, there seems to be some cases where you just say don't have enough information, or you know you're working to find a literary meaning, but but there are some allegorical things that you that are hard to get to, I guess, or hard to really prove out. Are you okay with any type of spiritualization, or I, I mean, in its proper context? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like to like sci-fi and just use over things. And a lot of times it's just making up stuff, right? But understood in the right context, do you, are you okay with that? Or? Well, I guess I would say that my main desire, and this is all of our main desires, is we just want to know what did God mean when he wrote that down. And so that's what I've got to try to find out. Are there things that we look at and we have a very difficult time Okay, trying to understand the meaning. Uh, we've looked back at what it meant in their day. We've tried to pin that down. We look at this wide river. We're trying to, you know, 
draw conclusions. Our theological principles are a little shaky. We're having such a hard time. There are places like that. Do I admit that? Absolutely. I would tend to be very careful, though, before I allegorize and give a potentially false idea. I would be much more comfortable saying that this is a really difficult passage of scripture and we really don't know exactly what this means. All right? I, I, I just, I'm comfortable with that when it needs to be said that way. Um, the, the error, the danger, I think, is that when we can't figure something out, we make something up, which worked great for raising my kids. Um, you know, I mean, they'd ask me questions all the time. I always gave my kids an answer, didn't I? I mean, they always got an answer. I had an answer for everything. They, they asked me a question, and my, I'd say, I don't know. You know how kids ask me 50 million questions? My son would just ask me, Dad, yeah, what does this mean? I don't know. And then finally one time he looked at me and said, just make something up. <laughs> he did. He did. Just make something up. I was, that was a green light from now on. We are just going to make something up. And so, uh, I mean, you want to talk about allegorical parenting. Never knew those two things went together. Did you? But, uh, you know, you, that's fun with that. But, but if it's really something where you're trying to determine, you know, what is the meaning of this passage, um, there are problem passages and there are places where we look at it and we say, we just really, really, really struggle to understand what it meant in their day. And if you can't figure out what it meant in their day, where does that lead you? Right? Now, some of the things, and this is probably one of the neatest things, and it's really, it, it, it's one of those things that's a shame. It, it, one of the things that's really a shame is that as the church today drifts off more and more towards this allegorical approach, they're miss, we're missing out because over time, as we've been studying the Word of God, and I want you to stop and think about think about that Word of God, because we've gone through like translations, we talked about history and those types of things. You know, the printing press comes out. When was the printing press? Around 1500, just flip <laughs> going 100 years one way or another, right? Okay, so, so we're in 2018. So it's only been, you know, a few hundred years, right? So not a long period of time since Bibles were flowing off of, you know, the, the printing press. And, you know, you really don't have much widespread scripture until 1600s. And now here we are. We've got all of these uh, people trying to translate the newest, greatest, latest translation because you can make money on every single translation, whether it sells or not. There's a lot of money to be made. Um, but here's the thing. There are passages that we didn't understand well until more recent time, as people have been studying. And that's why I, 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 I just, it bothers me that more uh, Christians are craving a deeper study and really pushing scholarship. Because what we're doing is, as time goes on, we're finding out, oh, this is what this meant in their day. Whether it's archaeology that's producing that, um, whether it's, it's, you know, different facts that are coming to light, whatever it might be, we're advancing in that. And because of that, it lends itself to better understanding of Scripture. So there are a whole lot of things that I really didn't have a clue as to how things fit together 25 years ago, and now I can look at different things and say, oh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And the more you study God's Word, the more that's going to happen. And so... If that's a real positive thing. So if anything, the church should be knuckling down and trying to, to really determine this literary meaning with a greater passion than ever. Uh, and so the things, that, the things that we don't know, um, we have to be careful with. Does that make sense? I'll give you an illustration. So back in 1974, um, uh, an evangelist came to our church and uh, he was preaching the whole week against rock music. All right? 
And believe it or not, you can find in the passage in Revelation a reference to rock music. I never knew it was there. I never knew it was there. But the Bible talks about the Bible talks about the scorpions. You remember the scorpions in Revelation? And they go out and they nail the people that are not, you know, the, 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 the people that have the mark of the beast. They go after them, right? And the Bible says that they have breastplates of, like, bronze or whatever. And I never knew it, but that's an electric guitar. <laughs> yeah. And the Bible says that they had long tails that would sting the people who had the mark of the beast. I never knew that those long tails were the cords that went to the amplifiers, and those amplifiers are what hurt people's ears. Whole week of that. <laughs> A whole week of that. Now, I always go back to that. I kind of laugh about it because it's like, what? Whoa. Now, listen, that guy, if he's still alive, he's probably not. Uh, but he'd be mortified by his own teaching today. So what's happening is that type of teaching, where he picked that up, or maybe he tried to come up with that total allegory, and he's going from church to church around the whole country. I mean, this is like a lot of people heard this, right? A lot of people heard that. And I thought to myself, whoa, that's really interesting. And at first, I was kind of like, ah. Oh, I never saw that before. Wow. And I had an electric guitar. Couldn't play it worth a lick, but I had one. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, that's terrible. There it is in Revelation. I, you know, I need to, 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 you know, Ted Nugent this thing. And uh, <laughs> then, you, you, then you get away and you start looking at it and you go, wait a minute. That's, that's terrible interpretation. So, again, I'd be careful about making stuff up. <laughs> um, there are places as you go through the scripture where you might see something that's really, you're convinced that this is a spiritual meaning, you know, and uh, you're looking at it. But always, if you're going to, to teach it or speak to that issue, you have to be really, really careful. And I think most of the time you have to do the audience a service of at least saying, this could be this, and I kind of think that maybe, and this is my idea, and take all responsibility right. for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? right. And uh, versus coming out and saying dogmatically, this is what it is. Because when that teacher came to the church, he told us, I mean, there was no wiggle room here. Okay, this is what this is. This is what this means. It's like, oh man, I just sit back and, I mean, we've done some studies in Revelation and Daniel and so forth, and it's kind of like, wow. That's all I can say is, wow. Man, was that, that that was really, really, really out there. And it happened in 1974, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, any other thoughts? Next week, we're going to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in uh, our understanding of Scripture, and as well, talk about the application aspect. So, it's the uh, last week. So I encourage it, one more week, and uh, then you can take the rest of the summer off. <laughs> you know, when we first started, it was light until 9 o'clock. And now it's dark at 7 o'clock. Summer's over. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? God, we just want to thank you for our time together here tonight. And uh, we're blessed, Lord, to uh, be able to study the material over here and, and really seek the literary meaning that you, uh, that you intend for us to know and understand. So, Lord, uh, we know that there are passages that we struggle with to understand, um, and there's things that um, uh, we don't know yet, uh, but maybe down the road um, it will be revealed. But Father, we just pray that uh, you just help us to be uh, really steady students of, of your word, that uh, we really would be extracting that meaning so that we might get the full weight of your word uh, placed in our hearts. So, again, I thank you for each one who's come tonight, Lord. I appreciate uh, their faithfulness, Lord, and I just pray that you bless them the remainder of this week, Lord, and uh, just ask that you continue to guide us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.